Hi all, I'd like to welcome you to our first online mid-year faculty meeting on this um, slightly fresh Canberra evening. <clears throat> I'd like to start off with uh, acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, I've just got a few housekeeping issues to uh, make you aware. So you're all muted, I can't see you, but Cheryl and Voice Lab were here, know who's online. Um, we will have time for questions later. Um, you can ask questions by either uh, putting your question into the Q&A section, which you should see somewhere at the bottom of your screen, or click the little hand raise button and then we know that you raise your hand. Um, Voice Love and Cheryl will manage the raised hands and then we'll unmute your microphone and uh, we can hear your questions. Uh, we are recording this event and I will make the slides available um, after this meeting as well. So just to introduce the panel members uh, that you hopefully can see on your screen, so uh, our invited guest this evening is Professor Ian Anderson. He, um, as you know, is the Deputy Vice Chancellor um, for Student and University Experience. Welcome, Ian. Um, and we also have the panel members here. Um, that would be Nikki Schembri, who you know. She's a lecturer with the Medical School and our Student Support and Wellbeing um, Academic. Also Sam Garami, who's the president of the ANU Medical Student Society, um, and Sally Lawton, who's the wellbeing officer of um, ANU MedSoc. Welcome you all. So um, I'll be trying to summarize a rather tumultuous six months um, in uh, the next 20 minutes and give you a bit of an update um, on what's been happening on ANU campus, um, within the college, mainly on Transform, and of course within the school. But let's start off with some celebrations. So you may be aware that Bill Nichols um, donated uh, a lot of money to support students who are interested in having a rural medical career. And the recipients of uh, this year's scholarship are Peter O'Brien and Lime, Liam McBride Kelly. They're year one students and they're looking forward to an interesting time here with us at the med school. And uh, as I said, looking for a career in rural medicine. Other scholarships to celebrate uh, here for the year one students. So we have the John James Foundation recipient, that's Frank Bongi, Peter Sharp scholarship recipient, Julian Hanna, and the National Indigenous Scholarship for Medicine, and Natalie Gordon is the recipient for that. And of course, we have our royalty ourselves in our medical school. Um, so at Queen's birthday, we had uh, Professor Christine Phillips receiving an AM, so she's a member of the Order of Australia, as is Professor Paul Smith. And Walter Abayaratna is, uh, received the medal of the Order of Australia, so he can now have an OAM behind his name. Congratulations to all, we're all very, very proud of you. So recently you may have seen some communication from the Vice Chancellor or read in the papers that there's some planned changes to the higher education funding from government with the stated aim to provide more university places. And that means that their reduced cost to the students themselves, um, particularly those students in healthcare, science and technology and education, as well as construction, we think there may not be a change in cost to students uh, who are doing medicine, but an increased cost to students of humanities, law and commerce. What that means for us here at the ANU, we're not quite sure yet, but I'm sure that will become clear over the next few months and the Vice-Chancellor will keep us updated. 
As you know, there was a vote to um, vary the EBA and to delay the pay increase that everybody was um, due to have this year, next year, um, by 12 months. And this has now been approved by the Fair Work Commission and is in place. The main topic though over the last five, six months really has been the financial impact that the bushfires, the hail and COVID-19 had on the ANU finances. There's been a loss of revenue just by COVID alone of about $150 million. And of course, there have been increased costs with the bushfires and the hail of about $75 million. So there's been a gap between income and expenses. And as I've previously explained, ANU <clears throat> has implemented an expenditure control framework, which essentially guides the colleges portfolios and the schools, of course, on what um, expenses uh, can be spent and what gets counted as a saving. And you had to defer $125 million of costs and we had to somehow plan to save $75 million by December. And this has been allocated to the colleges and portfolios. And when we get to the medical school section, I'll let you know what that means for us. With ANU um, and COVID-19 having a large impact, not just on education, but particularly on research as well, resulting in a lockdown of the campus for many weeks, procedures and risk protocols were developed. Um, there was a plan to uh, have a pilot or lead a pilot project to bring international students back that has now been delayed with the increase of COVID-19 infections, particularly in Victoria. Um, but ANU is still planning a return to campus for semester two, having started at the end of uh, this month. Um, we as a medical school, as you know, have decided not to open up with restrictions, but to stay on level B, which means we're partially open, essentially working from home as much as we can, but coming onto campus by uh, plan and by, by permission really. Um, I've already talked about the budget that needed to be saved. Um, there are uh, discussions ongoing about leave liabilities and um, that is particularly important as during this crisis, um, fewer staff are taking annual leave, which is an increased cost to ANU. What the ongoing border internal, not just uh, internally, but uh, externally, so internationally uh, mean for the future for domestic, international, students and their enrollments, we don't know yet, um, but uh, we assume that there'll be less enrollments, particularly from international students, um, this semester and next year. But how much that is, we're not really sure. The ongoing budgetary controls for 21 and 22, um, and the plans to increase revenue and expenditure control, as you can imagine, are a hot topic at every ANU executive and college exec meeting as well. And ANU's now started what they're calling a futures project, where there is a thought around what the future will look like in 2028 and what should we have done today in 2020 had we known now what we, sorry, had we known now what we will know then. And that's an interesting project. And once that's detailed, I'll send that around. It's a very interesting read. At the College of Health and Medicine, the big topic, of course, is Transform. So Transform has the vision to advance the health of the nations. And it's really an initiative um, to bring the college up onto the health and medicine arena internationally. And the new initiatives that Transform will um, include are in research, education, policy and practice, and culture and well-being. A concept brief was uh, written and uh, approved by the University Council back in December. And since then, um, associate deans leading these uh, initiatives have been appointed and they're Chris Phillips and Ross Hannon um, in research, working with Erica Kneipp, um, Julia Elliott and Alison Kevin in education, uh, Emily Lanshaw and Josh Fear in policy and practice, and Bruce Christensen working with Julia Sharwood in culture and well-being. With COVID, though, um, the initial plans for Transform have changed, and Transform has now pivoted um, its agenda to take more a pandemic resilience and recovery focus. And uh, Professor Grun spoke a little bit about what that means for the medical school at the town hall meeting last week, but what really the bigger Transform means for the medical school um, will uh, be developed over the next few months and he will come and hold another town hall meeting with us 
In the meantime, the associate deans um, are meeting with the senior faculty exec here at the medical school um, to inform us on what they're doing and get our input on how we can support transform. At the medical school, um, as you can imagine with COVID, we had to change our governance slightly. We now have an operation graduate management team uh, that meets nowadays uh, uh, every fortnight, but we used to meet uh, every day when um, COVID first started. Um, and with us are the senior faculty executive who are responsible to oper operationalize strategy and the senior faculty that generates the strategy. And these meetings are ongoing and very helpful. Within Operation Graduate um, Management, there are subgroups around research, teaching, learning, technology enhanced learning and teaching, operations, communications, staff, students, admissions and assessment. And the critical functions that we have defined um, back in March were around graduating our MCHD students this year and enrolling year one students for next year to plan for the curriculum delivery, track our students and staff so we know where they are, which is incredibly helpful now that we have hotspots um, in New South Wales and of course all of Victoria affected. Um, communication to staff and students has been very important and I hope we're doing enough of that. If not, please let me know. Um, but we also need to manage the research opportunities, maintain the school operations and plan our learning and assessment for year one, two and three. With the uh, easing restrictions within the ACT now, the lockdown um, has been abandoned and as I said, there's a gradual return to the campus and a return to campus for semester two. Um, and we have spent a lot of time and a lot of effort to not just use the facilities and the opportunities and the expertise that we have from the TELT team, but have very quickly moved all our learning online and were able after a six week break uh, to reinstate our year three and year four students into their clinical placements. Now we are in a contingency mode, and this is the ongoing uh, COVID-19 mode really, where our aims are to deliver the medical program, to maintain our admissions processes, to track students and staff and look after their health and well-being, to work on the curriculum for 2021, and to continue our communication for students and staff. Briefly, for those of you who were unable to attend the town hall meeting uh, for last, from last week, the big strategic initiative for the end of this year and probably for next year is to be a bit clearer on what the school will look like in the future. Uh, at the end of last year and uh, early this year, a task force that was led by Professor Imogen Mitchell, um, the director of this school, and uh, Professor Ben Kenny um, really identified and clearly described the vision and the distinctiveness of the school of the future. We now need to think about what that will look like and what that means for students, for academics, for researchers, for teachers, and for the college and ANU. And a second task force has been uh, put together, pulled together, which will look at school strategy, options for structure and governance, and then we'll have to develop a roadmap and a business case, and then think about implementing this over the next few years. The members for the um, task force uh, have now been invited and we will start these meetings next week. But what we really want to do, and which is a, probably of main interest to all of us, is to develop a model for the school of the future. Because as you know, three options have been put to us for the last year and a half, which were either to support the current model that we have, which you know is underfunded and has been lacking senior staff for the last five years or so. The other model that's been put on the table is a merger with another school and John Curtin is the school that's been named as that. Or to look at a different model, which is really us flexing our muscles, becoming very strong in education, not just for medical students or pre-medical school program, but really to dive into the executive education or post-grad arena. But with that, develop a very collaborative model in terms of research. Now, what that looks like, I don't know, um, but that's why this task force is um, being pulled together and we'll think about this. We think that we will have a uh, report written by November, but hopefully have decided on a model, um, so one of those three, um, by September. 
So um, back to the medical school itself, we've had a few professional staff departures and they're listed here um, and some academic departures as well. Particularly, I'd just like to mention that our inaugural professor of medicine, Frank Bowden, um, has taken leave from the ACT. Um, we would have usually held a little goodbye do for him or for somebody at this rank, probably a fest shrift, um, but that wasn't possible this year. So I've been liaising with Frank and we'll do that once COVID has settled a bit and we can get Frank back and we can invite people from um, within Australia to celebrate his career. Now we've had quite a few uh, professional staff appointments um, and this looks like a huge number, but remember we've undergone a professional staff review, um, which clearly outlined the deficiencies in our professional staffing and we've appointed new members to that. Plus with departures and not everybody working full time, we've been very lucky to um, welcome these new staff to the medical school and they've been doing a fabulous job over the time that they've been with us. Um, and the Rural Clinical School also had some new staff appointments. We've also, with really thinking through our curriculum and how we can deliver that to the students, have thought about academic appointments and we now have another Associate Lecturer in Anatomy. We finally have a, another academic coordinator, particularly for clinical skills in phase two, and it's been long in the coming. Um, Associate Professor Louise Stone is helping out in Social Foundations of Medicine, because as you know, uh, Christine Phillips uh, is taking a part-time job at the college and is very busy. Um, Stephen Martin has stepped up as a coordinator for clinical skills year one, whilst we had um, somebody on sick leave there. And we now have a senior lecturer for the Bachelor of Health Science as well. And we'd like to welcome Andrew Matheson to this role. And with appointments come promotions. And uh, from the beginning of this year, uh, Chris Phillips um, is a professor. Um, Rachel Lee is an associate professor and as um, it was evident in the, the latest newsletter, I think um, Chris Roberts, um, orthopedic surgeon, is a clinical associate professor. Congratulations to all of you. Through the college um, and uh, Russell Gruen's efforts to attract um, high level academics, but also to form connections to other organisations, um, we have appointed other people as well. Michael Kidd, whom you would have seen in the news and of course on social media, um, who's uh, working with government around COVID-19, is an honorary professor of this medical school at the college. Um, and we've got Emma Tucker, Lex Van Loon and Anne Steins having been appointed in the space medicine arena. Gary Lum, um, who also works as, uh, uh, in, the, in the health department, is an honorary professor. And Tracy Smart, um, is a professor in the practice of military and aerospace medicine, and I will introduce them to you um, maybe at our next meeting as well. And of course, um, you would have heard that Amanda Barnard, who really left the medical school, sadly for us, about two years ago, has returned as the Associate Dean of Royal Clinical School at least until next year, whilst um, Malcolm Moore has left this position. And we've had a few clinical appointments uh, in levels A, B, and D um, through our uh, medical school appointments committee. Congratulations to all of you. However, we are still short very senior staff, as I said before. We still don't have a professor for psychiatry, medical imaging, obstetrics, gynecology, and pediatrics. And that's not for lack of trying, um, but that is around the funding agreement between particularly Canberra Health Services and the ANU. Um, which of course is not uh, proceeding as we're all battling with COVID-19. The connection with Canberra Health Service or with ACT Health has also changed this year. So CHEC is the Clinical Health Emergency Coordination Centre, um, which um, as I stated before with Imogen Mitchell having been seconded to Canberra Health Services is part of and is leading. And um, we're liaising with them, particularly around the public health and Canberra Health Service directives about who can attend what placement or the medical school, as a matter of fact, or the hospital, um, or who needs to quarantine himself or herself. Um, so we talk a lot about placements, and that's the team that I continue to negotiate the placement with the medical students, because it would be really dreadful if the medical students were removed from their clinical placement again. 
Um, but we also talk about screening and the screening tool and the app that have been implemented by Canberra Health Service. There's also a clinical placement working group that we started back in April when the students were removed from their clinical placement because I think it is incredibly important to have uh, that ongoing discussion and particularly have information flow back and forth between ACT Health, Canberra Health Service, Calvary and us. And uh, we uh, are an email contact and we meet regularly. And we're really there to over, overview the clinical placements, to talk about processes um, and to monitor the health of our students. The ANU Canberra Health Service Task Force on Appointments, as I stated before, um, has been put on hold, um, but we do get updates from the ACT Health Chief Medical Officer as well, who meets with the other health directorates around the country on COVID-19 and how it affects students. I really don't want to talk too much about the budget because it's very depressing um, and I think you are well updated on that, but um, I think it's just briefly to say that um, the expenditure control framework that's been implemented by the ANU um, goes with accountability and regular reporting and applies to us as well and is tightly monitored. Um, we have been informed and we are also um, meeting our contractual legal and grant scheme and donor obligations and for us our obligations are to the medical students as well to run the program and to do the Bachelor of Health Science students to run the pre-medical program. Um, across ANU and with us, of course, we're looking not just at making savings, but actually looking um, at a strategy to make money, um, to have an income. And that's not just around international students, but also about research grants and possibly other ideas that we have in running courses that might bring us an income. So this is the only slide I will show you on uh, our budget, but I think it demonstrates the effects um, and the savings that we have made. Uh, I have met with quite a few of you, professional staff and academics, over the last few weeks to look at savings strategies that we can make. And I would particularly like to thank Katrina Chappell, our manager, who's been outstanding in pulling all of this together and uh, providing not just advice to me to learn about our budget, but advice to you on what is in and what is out of the savings that were counted within this um, ECF. Uh, but just to give you a bit of an overview, our budget for this year was about seven. Million, a little over $17 million. When this expenditure control framework came into place, what happened was the um, budget was adjusted and certain lines in the budget didn't really count because they were happening anyway or they were not happening anyway. Um, so travel was removed and transfers within um, a college or within ANU um, really didn't count towards the, the bottom case or the bottom number that we were meant to save against. And our base case then dropped from the 17.3 million to the to 12.8 million. And from 12.8 million, we were expected to save. Um, that's impossible. Um, what Katrina and you and the team have achieved is uh, to have a budget of about 15 and a half million dollars, which is about 2 million less than we had budgeted for. But that demonstrates to you how tight our budget is, how difficult it is for us to make any kind of savings while maintaining our research and our educational obligations. But I'd like to thank all of you who have um, put savings strategies and ideas forward to bring us to this number. This all added up to the college saving. So what are we gonna do for the rest of 2020? Um, so, of course, we have to finalise our budget for 2021, and those of you who are involved in that would already know about timelines and what to do. Uh, very exciting, of course, is the task force for the future, where we can hopefully put the unrest and the concerns about where we're going to go, what structure we're going to have, and what that would look like um, to rest and think about that. Um, we have uh, put a lot of thought into our learning and teaching for the future, and the year three and four students, and very soon the year one and two students are gonna give us some feedback on how our teaching is going and what we need to change and what we need to keep. And of course, we are now thinking um, very hard about assessments, particularly assessment that involves patients or people um, and how we're going to run the admissions process for the next year. So that's just a brief little overview on 
what happened over the last six months or so. Um, and I just wondered whether we should take questions for that. So if you have a question, please either raise your hand or put it in the Q&A section, please. Um, so we can see your questions. And I've just lost you now. James de Rosario, I hear he is lifting his hand. So if somebody could unmute James and then James, thank you for attending. Tell us your question. Is he unmuted? He has to unmute himself as well. James, you might have to unmute yourself as well so we can hear you. Alternatively, you can type your question into the Q&A section. How's that? Ah, oh, now we can hear you. Hi, James. All right. That's all right. Um, so, um, alternative sources of funding, because that's kind of, I mean, we've kind of been avoiding that, and I know we don't want to talk about that, but all that stuff you had up in your original slides about defining the brand of the med school and uh, giving us a distinctive kind of badge. I mean, money's an inevitable part of that equation. And I'm just wondering about Russell and others' thoughts of alternative sources of revenue beyond, um, you know, the um, overseas student issue, which is a big issue with COVID and, um, you know, with the philanthropy, particularly with the idea of that new model of the, uh, or the evolving model of the medical school. And, you know, whether we partner with John Curtin and then perhaps does that open up more access to philanthropic and grant funding? Has that been thought about? Not in detail, James. The task force hasn't met yet. Um, I know, and I'll... That, is that something I'll, they're likely to think about? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I hope that uh, Professor Anderson will maybe be able to talk a little bit about what ANU's views are on that. But there's a lot of um, uh, thoughts spent on that. Philanthropy isn't just the answer. It is, I think, in, in terms of saving, the Vice-Chancellor is very clear that we need to become a bit smaller and a bit more efficient. Uh, but in terms of how to make money, um, everything's on the table. Mm. So if you have any great ideas, please let me know. But robbing a bank is not the solution, James. No. We're a fairly small medical school as far as uh, scale goes. So uh, I would have thought we'd be uh, comparatively speaking ahead of the game in terms of savings. And there are limited opportunities there, but I don't know the details of that. So, yeah. but yeah, it's true. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Nope. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Anderson to you. So Ian is, uh, as I said, our Deputy Vice Chancellor Student and University Experience. Um, he is from the northwest coast of Tasmania um, and is a proud Palawa man. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Ian. Probably not. Um, and I really don't know how to summarize um, a career that he has and uh, bring out the expertise that he brings to ANU. Um, but he has been involved in leadership and delivery of student services, services at University of Melbourne. Um, he has been involved in developing pathways and academic support for Indigenous students in higher education across a range of disciplines, um, particularly medicine. Um, he's worked in Aboriginal health, um, has been a health worker, health educator, and he's a general practitioner. He was the Deputy Secretary of Indigenous Affairs in the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet in 2017, and Deputy um, CEO of the National Indigenous Australians Agency. <laughs> He's joined us in March, just in time um, to uh, help us out with a pandemic um, and provide uh, very, very valuable leadership to ANU. 
So I'd just like to hand over to Ian and maybe he can give us a bit of an update of who he is, what he's been doing and what he sees as the challenges, but also maybe the successes of um, his short stint here at ANU. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I'm trying, I'm still not used to the Zoom world. Uh, it's really hard to uh, have a yarn with a bunch of people I can't see. So bear with me and I haven't had a chance to uh, meet a lot of you. Um, I want to, I actually, um, uh, I, my, my kind of mind almost immediately went to a couple of scenarios, which I'll kind of talk through in a, in a little, little bit more. So um, the day I started ANU, uh, the door shut. So I've been <laughs> in a, um, uh, an unusual situation to start a job. Um, uh, it took several months before I actually could come back on campus. And so most of my kind of early collegiate and professional relationships has been mediated uh, by the two dimensional experience of, of Zoom. So it's been incredibly challenging. And, um, but I can tell you that I have never used my medical education so much as I have over the last few months. So my kind of long background is a public health physician and I've certainly been a public health practitioner, but as you do through your career, I've moved away from that. And, and my last job was as he, actually as a senior bureaucrat. Uh, um, and uh, I thought there for one time, actually for a moment that I should retire my, my, uh, my, my specialty and actually uh, stop paying all the fees you pay every year to the College of Physicians. Um, but I have never been so embedded in a public health project as I have kind of leading the university in how we work through the pandemic and then ironically leading the return to campus process for the whole institution, which would have to be um, was a challenge because I actually still hadn't met most people or seen most of the buildings uh, that we were actually negotiating our path back. But it also kind of made me think of, <clears throat> you know, uh, back in the olden days, as my, as my daughter tells me, um, um, when I actually still remember the very first moment on the very first day when I uh, landed at the University of Melbourne Medical School, coming from a you know, country kid, uh, an Aboriginal mum, um, a uh, you know father who was a, a, a farm labourer, and grown up, grown up all across uh, country Vic, uh, Victoria, New South Wales, and Tasmania, where I, where I was born, and where my my mum's people were Palawar and um, so that's my kind of traditional uh, clan um, uh, ancestry. Which, oh, sorry, I've got to, I've got to manage a dog. I'm just two sex. Um, she wouldn't, she wouldn't stay out there. She won't stay in. Um, so that's kind of, um, and I just there were two really profound things happening uh, at that point in time. So. Um, in the world of the early 1980s, most Aboriginal people couldn't guarantee that they could get access to healthcare uh, in an affordable way and in a culturally appropriate way. So uh, that whole world has significantly changed. We've still got major challenges in Aboriginal health, but we were really at the cusp of kind of leading change and leading change in provision of healthcare, uh, developing Aboriginal run health services, leading on strategy and workforce and building a, a much more responsive system. And it's an unimaginable difference from the world uh, that was, what, as it was when I was a first year medical school student and when uh, some of my uncles would come and give a lecture to uh, Aboriginal students and all my colleagues would heckle in the background. And that wasn't uh, an inviting heckle, that was a um, uh, a, a pretty unpleasant experience as a 17 year old. Um, the, uh, and I was actually one of the, um, at that point there were no Aboriginal doctors uh, in the country. We now have a, probably close to 400 and many of them now in kind of very leading roles in, 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 in the healthcare system. The, the, other, the other kind of profound um, uh, experience for me, and so I was, 
uh, you know, a country kid, Aboriginal kid, and also in the process as coming out as gay on campus in a world which wasn't that friendly at that time to gay and lesbian and transgender folks. I did that in the context of these, these things that were happening in New York and where a major pandemic, uh, HIV AIDS, first hit Australia. Now, um, uh, uh, the other thing, and the thing that's remarkable about that is that Australia did comparatively well in the public health management of HIV AIDS. And I'd, I'd add doing comparatively well, despite what's coming uh, you know, in Victoria to the early response to uh, COVID-19. But it was kind of a world where everything was upside down. And it's kind of the world you're in that moment. Uh, you're, uh, you're going to, throughout your career, live with the legacy of this moment, uh, both in terms of its impact on your educational opportunities, but also in terms of what this is going to mean for our global future. Um, medicine will change as a, as a consequence of COVID-19. Our lives will change. And there will be a moment uh, which is you know, deeply anxious making, but it will be a moment that collectively we will, we, will, you know, we will lead through, but it will call on your, on your skills uh, as, as, uh, future, as future doctors and your skills uh, as researchers and, and educators to really think about what is the significance of this moment. It, it kind of, it goes to uh, the core of a lot of my work uh, at the university at the moment. So my, my key responsibility is to actually lead us into a COVID safe uh, institution. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but I just wanted to reflect on on um, uh, what I think some of the challenges are for us to build a kind of a first rate uh, student experience, student and staff experience. Um, uh, I will go back again to um, my uh, younger years as a medical student. Um, I profoundly remember I didn't enjoy being a student, not at the University of Melbourne. Um, it was, you know, it was quaintly ruling class institution, lots of sandstone. Uh, lots of kids who all went to the same school whose mummy and daddy, sorry, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to flip it, be flippant, but, you know, who kind of knew that that's where they needed to be. Many good friends of mine now, but I certainly felt that experience of being a, a, a country kid in a, in a sandstone institution when, when none of my parents had actually finished high school uh, and uh, where... No one in my family had ever been to university and where I was a fairly naive young 17 year old who went home one day and said, oh, mum, I think I want to be a doctor. And she, um, <laughs> and my gorgeous mother, she dropped her crochet and then she swore at me. <laughs> and I said, why do you want to do that? And then eight years later when I graduated, she said, um, actually, I was really scared for you. Um, and she remembered the conversation um, and I remember her telling me this on her, her graduation night. So it's kind of been seared in my mind that uh, all over the years, and particularly my years with other Indigenous students, but also at the University of Melbourne, is that this is such a transformative moment uh, in, your, in your journey and that we have to actually mobilise in a way uh, that actually not only do you remember your classrooms, but you remember all elements uh, as a student of your uh, university uh, experience. There are um, a, a number of things which I think are fundamental to that. Um, I haven't worked out all the parts of the jigsaw. That's part of my job now that I've um, stopped being uh, COVID focused to actually start to articulate what that might look like uh, at a university level, but also what it might look like, uh, for example, uh, in the medical school. There's, there's an element of that which is really trying to focus on what is uh, what do we offer in terms of an on-campus residential uh, experience? A number of uh, you will have um, lived in a residential hall. My challenge is to, to make that experience more than just an accommodation experience, but a fundamentally nurturing and enabling experience as you, as, you, uh, as, uh, as students, you uh, connect to the broader uh, student uh, community. 
there are many challenges in that. Um, there are, there are cha challenges around building safe uh, environments and also um, environments that foster the connectivity between um, people from different walks in life, uh, different backgrounds, uh, and actually how people grow uh, in, in, a, in a nurturing um, environment. There's a big part of my work which is uh, thinking through how as an institution or how as a university uh, that we foster uh, conversations about values. Uh, values such as uh, economic freedom, values such as diversity, respect, uh, values such as gender equality, uh, and uh, issues around Indigenous uh, folks on this on on our on our on our virtual university, uh, but also our our, our place-based uh, experience. There's, um, <clears throat> I think, one of the challenges for me is to, and this is particularly uh, clear in the COVID virtual environment that we're all in now is how do we think about uh, fostering uh, connections to uh, our student community that reflect all the diversity of ways in which we connect both, both through the face-to-face -face connection and through the virtual connection and how we build that into our kind of university experience so that uh, folks like me uh, who are leading the institution has a really rich tap tapestry of ways in which students can connect and shape uh, that experience. I, I, I think that um, there's uh, you know, a significant piece of work for me to think about how, um, you know, how we think about the kind of the student experience from recruitment right through to graduation as a connected experience and particularly ensure that um, the services that we provide as an institution are connected, are high quality, and for students, they're easy to interface with. Um, often in institutions, and and is no different from any other large institution uh, I've worked in, um, the provision of services is often more about what the service provider wants rather than what, uh, in this case, our students need and what and and how how do we provide that in a way that's that that's seamless, meaningful. And part of that that journey. So there, there are a number of facets to the work I'm doing. I'm largely focused on all those bits of, uh, which aren't part of the academic uh, 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 delivery of the university. My colleague uh, Grady Venville is is very focused on the academic quality and the academic experience. But I think from our shared perspective, is that for from a student's point of view, it doesn't matter whether you're in the classroom whether you're playing sport or living in a residential hall, it's all, one, it's all one part of a connected experience. And our challenge is to make sure that that is a world leading experience and not an experience like I had as an undergrad when I kind of left and thought, well, gee, that was a bit tough. I'm glad I don't have to do that again. Um, so so that, that's kind of my, that's my, that's my day job, that's my day challenge. But I have been, um, working hard to try and work with uh, university leaders around what is a COVID safe uh, institution. Uh, we have to kind of think about how do we uh, enable and support the institution over the next 18 months. Uh, the kind of the COVID challenge uh, is not going to go away. Uh, we think that there are real prospects that at some point we might be confronting a Victorian like uh, situation and then the question is how do we keep the institution safe so we've been working hard to build a set of guidelines for um, uh, everyone across the university that looks at how we apply public health principles in all aspects of university life including teaching including research uh, including in the provision of services and you'll notice the impact when if you're uh, back on the Acton campus with all the signage around uh, which is kind of illustrating um, the sorts of things that we're doing and the messaging that we're doing. It, it is fundamentally a public health uh, based approach. Uh, so those of you who are more, f as you develop and kind of understand what kind of the broad set of public health strategies, I hope you see some uh, familiarity in the approach. Um, in the classroom, um, I expect that, you know, everyone has to play a role uh, in a COVID safe classroom. 
but it's really challenging in your clinical context. Um, but I think there are just three fundamental principles, social distancing, hygiene, and at some point, face mask wearing. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about the current thinking around face masks. Um, and I think that to understand that really getting a safe outcome for all of us, we all have to play a role uh, for, your, for, your, for your lecturers and your tutors. They understand the kind of the university guidelines. So that will provide you guidance um, uh, on, in the particular context we, in which you're at. Um, for um, students, um, you know, there's an expectation that you'll work with us on this. Um, this is not easy for us. You know, we, we don't have the, all the answers in all the contexts, but what we're looking for you is to work with us to work together to create that in, environment. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, because I'm probably at the end of my time, whether it might be a point for me to stop and just really reflect on some of the challenges. I'm really happy to take questions or have questions uh, th through the panel. Well, thank you, Ian. That was a fabulous summary of where you've come from. Um, we seem to be sharing the same experience regarding being students at medical school, but also a great summary of um, where you're trying to get um, us to, in um, particular during these difficult times. So I think if it's okay with you, it might just go directly to the panel, but I think it's important for you to know that um, for us, the, not for us, it's, for me, it's not just about the student experience, but actually working in partnership with students, because in the end, the program's for them. Yeah. Now, this is not about giving them answers to the exam questions, but particularly during this COVID period. So I've just shown the operator operation graduate management team in the subgroups we've got students on each group not just on the the high level management team but on the subgroups as well and to me um that's been terrific because i really came up with ideas uh brought up things that we hadn't thought about and it was a real real partnership now two of those are here and i think we might just start um with sam uh who is as i said our medsoc president to give us a bit of a spiel on his experience over the last six months as holding the presidency over to you, Sam. Thank you, Jujoka. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share part of that student experience. Um, and I think I'll probably focus mostly on, on working with the medical school as a, as a student advocate. And I think Sally will share part of that on the ground experience that students have had this year. Um, and, and again, I'm very grateful to be here and very thankful to all of you for having worked tirelessly in the past few months, really, for us. Um, I must say that I have learned more in the last six months than I have in any other time in my life about everything from my own psyche to how we deal with pressure, how, we, how, we, how leadership happens through a crisis, uh, and also about being part of a team. As Jujoka said, and I think that's probably the most important bit of them all, the fact that we are a team. Um, I think the medical school has set a fantastic example of how we can work together in times of crisis towards the common goal. And that common goal, I think, was really magnified and, and well set up by our operation graduate. It was very simple. We got to graduate four years and admit students and graduate doctors um, and do so well. Uh, and as Jojo mentioned, I'm very happy and grateful that we have student representation at all of those places of operation graduates and all of its many arms. Um, and I want to pay, pay homage to those, to many students who have again, like our wonderful faculty, gone above and beyond to create alternative learning opportunities to support one another and to maintain the higher standard of their own medical education. Um, and Sally is one of those students. Um, I think the medical school has really shown leadership, and I, and I say this with comparison to other medical schools and that sucks that I'm in close contact with in this inclusion and has shown that the students are the most important part of the medical school, perhaps only second to the patients that we are here to serve. Um, and I want to thank the medical school for that, for allowing us in this structure, granting us power and representation. And I firmly believe this has been the most important part of the school's response to the pandemic. Um, albeit I'm a bit biased. Um, I know we'll continue to work together as we face the next steps of the challenge, and that's making sure we have fair assessments that can benchmark our competence still, and, and even if they have to happen through Zoom, and, and making sure we have plans, B and C, and all the way down the alphabet, for 
if things get worse before they get better, what are we going to do in delivering our curriculum? I think on, on a sort of a broader scale reflection, what the pandemic has shown us is two things. One, one is essentialism. So who has to go to work if everything is shut down? What matters most in our lives? Um, and it's also exposed our weaknesses that, for example, that our healthcare system is only as good as the care we give to the most disadvantaged people in our society. And I think you can see that manifest in the USA right now. And the fact that we're all deeply interconnected and codependent and we have to work together to survive. And I think the macrocosm of the medical school has been no different. So we've gone to back to the things that are essential. We have students who are well and who are training to be competent and safe. And there's still a lot we can learn from this minimalist approach, I think, even as we move on to the aftermath of COVID that as we rebuild the curriculum, I think we should do so in a more focused way, giving even more weights to the parts that enable a graduate to be safe and competent as an intern. A curriculum that recognizes that a longer list of checkboxes is not always better, um, and it is specific in what students need to learn and, and gives more feedback as we progress through our curriculum. And I also like to think that it will be a more compassionate curriculum because we have now recognized very well that the rigidity of medical school curriculums is, is arbitrary. Um, we have to provide students with more options. We have to support them better as they go through challenging periods um, and recognize that people's situations change uh, just as the world does. And so our learning passions must be flexible as well. Um, and I believe we will do better um, together as a team. Thank you, Sam. That's right. Great, great summary, thank you. Now, as you can imagine, the well-being of staff and students has been um, at the forefront of our thoughts ever since we've been reading about the scary development of the infections overseas. Um, and uh, I think it is fair to say that for a new staff, whether they be researchers, particularly um, within the College of Science and us, of course, um, but also the educators and professional staff, this has not gone without challenges. And I'd just like to um, introduce Sally to you, um, who is, <laughs> I don't know whether she really knew what she was taking on uh, when she became the well-being officer of the MedSoc, but Sally, if you wouldn't mind giving us a bit of a summary of what your experiences were and how you um, supported each other. Yes, thank you for that introduction. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so my name's Sally. I'm a second year medical student um, and I took on the well-being officer role this year for the Medical School Society. Um, and I've just been asked to share with you some of my views about the major challenges um, to wellbeing faced by students this year. Um, but firstly, I'd just like to echo what Sam was saying and extend my thanks to the medical school for, for actively seeking student involvement in the various committees and working parties this year. I really think these lines of communication between students and faculty have and continue to have um, just be an invaluable resource to us. Um, so um, I'm, I'm hoping that these can continue to the future because I think they've been really useful. Um, so this year has been challenging for pretty much everyone <laughs> in some form or another. Um, and for students, the challenges faced have actually been quite varied because um, we have you know, a number of groups of students um, that face quite um, difficult challenges. So today I thought I'd just mention a few key groups of students that I know are facing particular challenges, um, as well as just discuss the general experience of phase one and phase students this year. Um, so just to start off with, um, the lockdown and border closures earlier this year, um, particularly saw our international students facing really difficult decisions around travel um, and uncertainty in the future of their study. So this has been a major challenge for their well-being as a group. Um, as well as this, many of them um, may have been supported by family overseas and so now face financial difficulty into the future as we start to see the economic impacts of COVID across the globe. Um, and this, along with the fact that many international students are ineligible for government and financial assistance means that these students in particular um, will likely face financial difficulty in the coming months and years. So I see this as an important and emerging need to focus on this group and ways of supporting our international students through this difficult time. Another key group of students are our parents and carers. Um, we have lots of students who are parents or care for other family members. Um, 
and actually remote learning for this group was welcomed um, for a lot of them because it allowed flexibility to care for dependents, particularly for phase one students. Um, however, juggling an entire family at home as when you're trying to study, I think was also quite a difficult task as I'm sure many of you in the audience probably have also experienced. Um, but that flexibility was welcomed for many students. For phase two parents, um, a kind of emerging challenge now has been dealing with bugs that children bring home from school, which translates into now in the COVID era needing to take time off to get a swab and etc. And this has been can be quite disruptive to study. So this is a new kind of challenge for them. Um, and these this group of students will likely require ongoing support from medical school as well, um, as well as just reassurance and understanding about juggling career and study pr priorities, which has already been happening and is um, well received. The general experience for phase one students has, has on the whole been fairly positive, um, uh, particularly again with the flexibility around remote learning and being able to be at home um, close to your family has been um, excellent and the medical school did that quite quickly which was which is um, excellent. Um, also the, the students that found remote learning challenging, um, the support that the academic um, lecturers and tutors um, have shown to the students has been really well received and it's very much appreciated. Sometimes I don't think that comes across but uh, a lot of the students have found that um, lecturers and tutors have been really easy to contact and very happy to help during this time when you're pivoting to an online learning experience. So that's, thank you for that. Um, a specific challenge for phase one students, uh, those many of us live on campus, um, which at the start of the year during the lockdown period was a bit of a difficulty. Um, but the medical school faculty who have taken on advocacy roles to li liaise with residencies and colleges has been, and again, continues to be in a very important role um, to ensure student wellbeing and accommodation security. So thank you for that as well. Um, now, I'm not a phase two student, but the general experience I've gathered from the phase two students has been that time spent out of hospital during lockdown was quite frustrating um, for many students, but many were delighted to return back to the hospital setting and it was excellent that that could happen so quickly. Um, however, the transition back to face to face teaching has been difficult for some students, um, particularly those with health issues themselves. Uh, or those with family interstate that are affected by border closures. So this continues to be uh, an ongoing challenge for those students. But despite all this, um, the students have actually shown remarkable resilience and a really strong sense of community during this time. Um, and with the continued support of the medical school that they've shown already, I have no doubt that we can continue to, continue to tackle any further challenges to come. So thank you. Thank you, Sally. Great summary. And I'm always surprised how people talk about working from home or studying from home when really what is happening is you're at home during a crisis, trying to study, trying to work. Not that easy, isn't it? Okay. Um, and last not least, uh, Nikki Schimbri, who you know is our well-being academic. Um, Nikki, if you wouldn't mind giving us a bit of an idea of what your role was over the last six months and where you see um, the support for the students and your role particularly going over the next 18 months or two years while we still um, struggle with COVID-19. Indeed, yeah, thank you very much, Joka, for that introduction and thanks Sally and Sam um, for sharing your experiences and as you can see, quite a list of concerns have and issues have been highlighted by the students themselves. So. What do you do as uh, you know as a team of supporting staff and this whole thing happened overnight so we started with the students having these dreams of finally graduating fourth years first years coming to possibly a new place wanting to make new friends and suddenly overnight um, they just told that the campus is locking down they're unable to meet their friends anymore and suddenly everybody goes um, remotely so I was just facing this situation where we're deeply concerned about the fact that possibly isolation and the lack of routine for our students is going to really impact on our students' well-being. So how do you go about uh, putting this all together and making sure that everything is streamlined and really making that student experience a positive one, like Professor Anderson was saying, despite all this negativism that was going on around us, 
in, even for ourselves as academics, we had no idea where we were standing. So as a launch, we needed to try and get ourselves sorted first to try and make sure um, everything was in place for our students. But I must admit, I just couldn't have done this by myself. Um, I've got um, great appreciation for the support I got by um, my support team and as the academic team who um, got together um, in this um, situation. So what we did is we established a well-being working party um, that namely um, involved the year coordinators who are Brett Schultz for first year, Zan Min Song for second year, Serena Watron and Deputy Tellerithi for third year and William Huang for fourth year. But in particular, we had Sally on board with us, which was a central pivotal um, experience in the way we shared um, each and everyone's experience. But obviously this is a student-centered um, process that we have put in place. And without the student being present in our discussion, there is absolutely no way we were going to focus um, um, our, our resources really. So we met on a weekly basis at the start of all this and uh, once the restrictions have been eased and uh, our face to students were back into clinical placements, we're now holding these meetings on a fortnightly basis. We also had a WhatsApp group chat set up so that we can do um, you know, real time um, troubleshooting since as you all know, things were changing by the minute and there's no way you know, from one meeting to the other, you know, the world would have toppled all over. So, so that worked extremely effectively. The, the individual members on the team were extremely dedicated and knowing how busy their schedule is, I have no idea how they managed to sleep at night. I think we were all dreaming of replying to students' emails and so on and it just was fantastic. As part of this team, we also wanted to set up a quarantine team and the idea of the quarantine team, um, which was named the year coordinators, was to address issues of students that were identified to us as needing to be self-isolated or in quarantine due to the um, restrictions put in place. And particularly in the event, if any student was found to be positive, Fingers crossed, we had no students um, detected positive uh, since the start of this pandemic and hopefully we'll maintain our hygiene and social distancing to keep this in place. But as you can see from what Sally and Sam have been saying, our role, our pastoral role was really stretched beyond its um, job description, so to speak, if it does have a job description. We found ourselves being um, real estate advisors, um, with regards to the accommodation um, facilities, financial advisors on what to do with your finances if they're running thin on the ground, um, in addition to trying to give um, general health and also mental health um, advice. As white mind might expect, um, even people who can normally have, you know, lead a very resilient life, a situation like this definitely built up stress and anxiety and it, it was really difficult to try and um, manage all this but slowly we, we, I think we seem to have um, worked it out. Particular focus we also wanted to put is on our international student cohort as Sally was saying and I was very much in close contact with the MedSoc international student representative Arlene Gabriel who's done an amazing job at uh, keeping in touch with the students and our academic um, liaison representative who is Dr. Sivraj, um, who's been leading um, all the discussions with the international students, particularly when issues arose with regards to the visa restrictions um, and their financial constraints that the COVID um, situation put on them. We want to make sure that this group of students are definitely not isolated and they're kept into the loop. We do know of two of our students who, are, who actually, actually decided to continue their online studies overseas and you can imagine how isolating that might feel. So we just want to make sure that they're kept in the loop and still feel part of the ANU Medical School. Um, challenges that we met, we came across that we really didn't expect, you know, being in a virtual learning space definitely um, made us learn a few things, things that we didn't think were going to crop our way, but it's definitely been a very steep learning curve for all of us. And I'm looking forward to the future that there's going to be lots of lessons learned um, from this experience, uh, particularly with regards to support. And we really want to reinforce and maintain 
the support network that we've established uh, both on the front of peer-to-peer -peer support but also academic uh, faculty member staff and the student relationships um, on a horizontal and also vertical um, process and uh, I want to say a really big thank you to my team members and I really look forward to continue working with them in 2020 and 21. Thanks everyone. Great, thank you, Nikki. Great summary. So, um, so here are the panel members. Any question is a fair question. So again, either put them into the Q and A section or raise your hand. And while you're thinking of challenging questions to the team members, maybe I can just start off the discussions and um, just outline to you what uh, the discussions are within the medical schools within Australia and New Zealand who face the same issues that we have. Uh, worse, as a matter of fact, because there are um, uh, students who are now COVID-19 positive in Victoria, students who can't attend placements, people who are locked up in Perth or Tasmania, and so on and so on. And Ian, I, um, sorry, the, the discussions that we're having, having now is that I think it's become quite clear that a lot of the learning, learning material you can learn from wherever you are. Uh, but it, there are some things that still have to be done practically, whether they be certain practice in the preclinical years, whether there's some clinical skill sessions where you really need to practice your, your skills. And uh, within the uh, universities, we're now thinking of, what do we really call it an exchange program? But if our students are stranded in Victoria or some of Victorian students are stranded here, whether we can just facilitate that type of learning here. So it's becoming really a, a discussion around a virtual, <laughs> truly national university across you know, all states and territories. And Ian, I, I wonder whether with the concerns um, around international students, um, things like that have been discussed. I know there have been discussions about us actually going, somebody from ANU actually going to other countries to provide some face-to-face -face teaching and learning there that otherwise would have happened here. But are you aware of other schools or colleges having those discussions about helping each other out during COVID-19 or whether that's something that we can actually look at as a, you know, a, a, a national university to liaise with other universities, maybe even worldwide to uh, facilitate a different learning experience? So, so I, I can't speak of the med school context at the moment, but I, look, look, I think now is the moment to be innovative and creative. I, we are, this is not a situation that's just going to solve itself. Um, and there are kind of different views of what the kind of public health future is, but I'm, I'm personally not holding up for a vaccine solution. I think there's enough evidence out there to, to suggest, and anyone who's got a knowledge of the coronavirus family, that that's... That, that, that's a good thing to aim for, but we shouldn't be hanging out on it. Um, so, so one of my, my challenges and more generally is across the university community is that we're going to have to change our model of teaching practice. There are some things like, for example, large lecture room the teaching that I don't know are going to come back. I can't say this in honesty, but this is the time when we need to be creative. And that creative... Um, a, a, Kind of, you, you used the word co-design, I think, before. Uh, that, that, that is fundamental to it. Um, we, we have to work within the kind of our public health framework that we have across the country. Um, but there are ways in which we can start to think about movement of folks across borders uh, to facilitate exchange. So um, we, we, we we're in hours of trying to think about how we might um, facilitate um, our student or students from Victoria into Canberra um, literally within hours and, and what happened uh, was that ACD government rang it and said and they've been encouraging uh, us to think about this like a, a student a safe transit over over the over the border and they rang to say we've just been overwhelmed by uh, our quarantine services and really, we just don't have the, the space, which is one of the, re the the fundamental reasons why we put off the international pilot. So I, I'm I'm not a big enough brain to figure out every um, 
uh, solution to our teaching challenge. But I think collectively, what I would be encouraging uh, you to have as a medical school is exactly that sort of conversation. Uh, let, let's kind of put this the old rule book aside. Let's think about what we need as a baseline for our teaching experience and making sure that when you graduate that you're all safe, but let's, let's think creatively. Great, thank you. Sam, you talked to other MedSoc presidents. What are the mm -hmm. wish lists or discussions that you guys talk about, and ladies, sorry, um, in terms of um, schools working together a bit more closely, maybe not just to support transition or quarantining, but also about learning and teaching and research, as a matter of fact? Um, it's actually been, that's probably been one of the most interesting aspects of the experience of this year is that every year we have good communication and collaboration between MedSoc presidents and MedSocs generally and with AMSA who's the, the Australian Medical Student Association which is the national coordinating body and this year it's been sort of it's now the assumption that everybody's going to work together you know there's no question that we should be sharing resources that we should be collating ideas and we, we are now applying that to our advocacy as well that hey if you're asking our medical school that hey let's try this idea it's very worthwhile to ask the other medical schools the same thing and ask what's worked in the other schools. And I think to some degree, it's already happening through MDANS. But really, we expect the schools of the future to be more collaborative rather than competitive because it just, it just makes more sense this way. At the end of the day, we're all trying to do the same thing, which is graduating competent doctors who are serving the whole of this Australian nation. Um, and now's the time to bring it together. You know? okay. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so we have a Q&A here. So Diana Perryman um, says that she thinks that video conferencing should be here to stay. As a school, I think we have benefited from this mode of communication. One innovation is to build it into a new post-COVID world. There'll be a balance. But she wants to know, how do our student reps feel about the use of video conferencing for the education in the future? I think that I do think video conferencing should stay. And we actually just talked about that uh, in MedSoc meetings. And I think that in the years to come, they should all happen online because it, it <laughs> makes it more accessible for people, especially for rural students. And I do think the same sentiment has to be reflected in our approach to education as well. The flexibility that video conferencing has provided is particularly useful to some minorities of students, like Sally mentioned, parents and students who are rural, students who have to be away because they have a sick family member in another city, which, which is the case for a student right now. And that student would have had to take complete leave from the school if the situation wasn't what it is right now. At least they can be part of, part of the school at the moment. Okay. Sally, what are your views? Yeah, I agree with Sam. I think um, particularly for phase one where most of the content can be delivered online um, it's been really well received and a lot of people were actually really happy that they could go back to their families or state of origins to um, to study uh, that was really well received and like Sam said those specific groups of people who have caring responsibilities um, you know if they have their own health needs that they can they can study when they want how they want um, which is which is really good and, and actually the students have been um, taken it up really well as well. I think our generation embraces technology a lot. <laughs> so I think a lot of people actually quite enjoyed it. I think for phase two students, it was a little bit more difficult because um, a lot of the phase two, stu two students were really keen to get back into clinical work. And obviously that is a challenging thing to be able to deliver that kind of content in an online format, but it's not a insurmountable challenge. And I think it could be um, in conjunction with perhaps. Um, so, you know, rather than having face-to-face -face tutorial, tutorials one day a week, you could make that stuff online, um, is absolutely doable. So yeah, I agree with Sam. Okay. Okay. And Ian, I assume across the ANU campus, everybody's thinking the same, right? Yeah, and I think that there are, um, uh, there, there are ways to be creative to achieve the same public health outcomes, but at the same time, a better quality experience. So I'll give you one a really live uh, example. So 
one of one of the challenges um, uh, at the moment is for students in residential halls. Um, our early approach is really a fairly uh, standard public health approach, which pre prevents uh, a lot of social contact, uh, maintaining social distancing uh, and social hygiene. One of the implications was is that for a lot of students, it was a pretty awful, a pretty miserable experience. Um, we, we've just renegotiated a different model with ACT government. So what we're trying to do is think about how do we achieve the same public health outcome, but actually make it a more livable experience. It's, it's, not, a, it's, not, it's not pre COVID, it's not as good as, but a more livable experience. So what the, the model that we're going to work on implementing in a number of the residential halls, we can't do it in all, uh, will, is a family pod model. So we're looking at ways in which we can uh, work within uh, cohorts of about 25. Uh, the rules are uh, social distancing applies, the standard rules apply if you're outside that cohort, but if you're inside that cohort, you can actually breach the social distancing rules. You can go and have lunch together and you can behave more like a family, yeah? But the, the fundamental rule is if, if one of you gets a, um, a COVID positive test, then you all have to go to the COVID hotel. So, but, but kind of what we're really struggling for is how do we get a better quality experience, but keep the kind of same safety uh, in a manageable way. So it's the, there are ways in which we can think creatively, but we're gonna to have to work through those uh, and think them through in almost in a case by case way. Thank you, great idea. Um, James the Rosario, I think, was going to ask a question again. So I think you're unmuted, James, and you might have to- I am, I think I can, yes, am I unmuted? Worked it out now. Worked it out, even I Good work it out. Um, Jorg, I've got a bit of a two-pronged question. Uh, initially to, uh, is it Sam and Sally, our student reps? And then probably the second part should go to you. So given that this year has been, you know, challenging in so many ways and tested our resilience and adaptability and the learning curve has been frighteningly steep for all of us, I just want to get a sense of the students. Do Is there a sense amongst the student community that at one way or another, when particularly this year's goal of graduating safe, you know, doctors for next year to fill our internship positions, is there a potential view amongst the students that the COVID thing in one sense may ultimately have been terminally disruptive. And by that I mean is that despite all the efforts we've just talked about, that the Dean and Professor Anderson and uh, Imogen in her role as uh, lead in the COVID response in the hospital, uh, you know, we come up with a way of assessing the delivery of the content in the new format, but because the challenge to the students is such that, you know, for instance, the students are unsuccessful in their final grades. Will the disruption be taken into account? And I'm asking this because I'm on the committee, the College of Physicians Adult Medicine exams, which is struggling with the same thing at the moment. And that college of committee, uh, that college committee, made an executive decision about a fortnight ago, approved by, you know, the president, is that this for this year, the candidates sitting the RACP will basically have a free kick. And by that I mean is we're going to run the exam with new technology, un, un, untried, unprecedented. And we've tried to get that out there. And at the moment, all those candidates are trying to prepare for it. Uh, but the college has resolved that, because uh, normally you get three shots at the clinical before you have to return to the beginning of the cycle. So for this year, for the College of Physicians, if they don't pass the exam, and because of all that's happened this year, that won't count in terms of their cumulative numbers. And I'm just wondering whether 
I'd like to know the attitude of the students, whether that, whether they feel that that's a good policy. And then from you, Zsorka, whether the medical schools considered that kind of contingency. Um, I guess I'll, I'll answer the first part and I'll leave the second yeah. to you, Zsorka. Um, in terms of whether students feel like COVID has been a terminating event, I wouldn't say so. I do think it's, it's been a terminal event for parts of our medical education. The same Not way it's terminating, been terminating, Sam. You've got a long career ahead of you. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, the same way that it's been terminal for a lot of bits of the way we live at the moment. But I don't think students feel like it's been so disruptive that they, they feel like, oh, I won't be able to be a competent doctor at the end of this. And I think that particularly is the case for, it's particularly relevant to year three and four students who have had a disruption, who are experiencing different clinical placements than they usually would. But regardless, I don't think any student thinks that this is not enough. They might feel like it's less than it used to be, but I don't think they feel like there is no way this can be enough to make me a competent doctor. Well, that's do a great tribute to the students. That's a great tribute to the students' resilience and uh, positivity, I think. I'd say so. And of course, also hats off to the medical school and to, to HD Health and everybody else who has accommodated students so that the experience is adequate. Regardless, disruption has been significant. And I do think, and the attitude we have had from the school really throughout the year has been that we all recognize there is a disruption. We all recognize that there is a pandemic going on. Um, and so the expectations from the students will be adjusted accordingly. Now, we don't know exactly what those adjustments will look like. And I do like the idea of a free kick. Unfortunately, I think we already get as many free kicks as we want, or quite a few. Um, but yeah, maybe Jujoka, we, we could have another extra sub <laughs> if students fail and then fail again. <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Sally, did you want to comment on that question from a phase one perspective? Yeah, from a phase one perspective, our exams are lower stakes, obviously, because we have a few more years before we actually have to graduate. Um, I, I think generally people, phase one students tend to have probably actually been spending less time worrying about exams this year and more time actually trying to learn the topics, which is a positive change, I think. <laughs> I think last year there was a much more focus on doing the exams and getting a good score, whereas this year the, the focus is more you just need to learn the stuff and you need to reach the hurdles. And that's, that's kind of the attitude people have in phase one at the moment, um, which again has been supported by the medical school because the uh, expectations on us have been quite clear that, you know, the exams have to be there obviously to make sure that we reach the goals that we need to, but they're not trying to trick us and they're not trying to punish us in this horrible of all horrible years. <laughs> I could add to that quickly that, that's a sentiment I've heard from phase two students as well, that when we say the, the, you know, the long cases don't have, you don't have to ha have ticked as many boxes, just make sure that you're competent, just make sure you really take advantage of all the opportunities you have. That's been liberating for some students. They have said, now I'm really focused on learning. Now that, you know, the portfolio is something I'm still, I still care about. I know it's the benchmark I have to pass, but now that I know what it could look like without, these placements. I really cherish them. I'm really focused on the learning now. So James, I had hoped that um, David Kramer would be online too. So I could <laughs> bat that question. To Sorry. Him. But he's not there. Um, so I'll try and answer that. So will the students Just take it on, no on notice? No, no, no. Will the students get a jail card? No, they won't. Because yeah. the, the thing you haven't mentioned, James, is I don't know whether it's the same with the physicians as it is with the pediatricians. Yes, you can resit that exam, but that's a year later. Of course, every student who fails, I don't know how many subs, is more than welcome to resit the exam a year later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there have been quite a few, I guess, out of jail, or let's say um, adjustments being made, because we realise with the uh, ability to bring the students back into placements, but restrictions around their behaviour, you know, they can't wander around now and look for long cases, or, hey, there's yeah. a cool, cool murmur there. There have been... Um, it's quite clear that, that a lot of the things that they used to be able to see if they wanted to, because again, it's very student dependent, they may not. 
Okay, so that tick list of portfolios is gone, and we're really focusing on the quality of learning rather than the quantity of tick boxes that you've got. And I think Sam described that quite beautifully. The exams themselves will change to make it a bit more um, obviously COVID nineteen friendly, but I hope future oriented online and you know getting rid of stuff that's rather traditional and possibly not really assessing the student's competency or knowledge. Um, and of course, there will be ample opportunity to adjust for any kind of situation that the students had. And the students, I hope, Sally and Sam are quite aware that, um, you know, to ask for special considerations, we're very lenient there and we, we take all that into account. And of course, the, the well-being, the distancing that they've had, the travel they had to do or not, and the, the lack of experience, um, we're very aware of. I think more importantly, James, is not so much whether the students pass or fail, because I'm quite confident that, that they'll pass as much as they did over the last few years, but recognising and being aware of the gaps that they have in work, particularly in the ACT with Canberra Hospital um, and the um, people who are responsible for the intern training to pick that up and not assume that students are the perfect, you know, James the Rosario of the future, um, but that they need help and that it's completely okay that certain things you know, that they're essentially L platers, um, but that, that needs to be recognized and that needs to be rectified with support and education. And that's what we're focusing on. Can I, can I just make a quick observation? Absolutely. You're not the first people that are confronting this very question. Look at what happened in New York just a few months ago. And this, this might be where kind of learning globally can actually help solve some of our local problems. So, the, the, the graduating cohort in New York were facing exactly this, this problem in our circumstances than we, are, than we are dealing with here in Canberra. Mm, right. And I think the students, particularly in the States, um, James and Ian, have learned more in the last four months because they had to step into the shoes of the docs who were sick or who died. Um, yeah. so they were, you know... Um, medical students manning the ICU. I'm not saying that's a good thing. But they get a lot more experience in intubating and doing whatever not. And here in, in Australia, we had the assistance in medicine idea and really um, ramp up the students' um, clinical uh, participation than if they were just students. So that's a good thing. The exam is a, is a way that, that we have it in a certain way here at, at our med school that I think we can change and needs to change to be a uh, have, have a different model, maybe be done at different times and in a different yeah. way. No, look, Jojoka, I think that they're very pragmatic and kind of mature responses to what, you know, is in some ways a, uh, I don't think there's any perfect solution, obviously. No. I think part of that, though, is um, I think uh, there needs to be probably a community awareness of that, so I'm talking about the end consumers. That is the uh, public that we treat. There's going to be, quite rightly, a, a, a large responsibility of the supervisors of those graduates as they go forward in their careers, um, adapting the their expectations, I guess, to a degree, and allowing the, um, I guess what could be described as the dotting of the I's and crossing of the T's in those junior postgraduate years that may have been detracted from somewhat. Uh, so I think whilst you and everyone else that's tuned in today and the students uh, are highly attuned to that, there are probably segments of the community that could be well served with um, also perhaps being attuned to that. Uh, I'm talking about hospital administrations, uh, other clinicians that are involved in supervision um, and uh, the consumers. I don't know whether you think you may well have already conceived that idea and steps are already being taken. So we're talking to Canberra Hospital. But <clears throat> yeah. Um... Uh, I assume that Carolyn Drosty would be uh, liaising with, with Calvin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, part of that um, might be something that we look at when we talk about the School of the Future. 
Yeah. Uh, we do have consumers on that group, so that's a very important point you made. But you know, one good thing for the College of Physicians is that this virtual format of the long case examination may well be the standard of the future because it's okay. logistically it's got certain advantages that the traditional old way of bringing patients in and flying examiners all around country at great expense, you know, it doesn't compete with that. So I think, or it does, it, you know, it's much better. So there's a positive. Exactly. And think of the carbon footprint. Okay, mm. James, I might just go to the next. Thank you for yeah. the question. I might just go to the, in looking at the time, unless you guys have lots of questions. There are two more uh, Q&A. So the first is from Christina Valtacocci. who wants to know what the student reps feel about the absence of practical classes in phase one. And I think that's back to the, the conversation that we're at, or the point that you brought up, Sally. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so I think the there are definitely practical classes that are incredibly valuable and would be almost impossible to deliver entirely in an online format. So I'm thinking particularly about anatomy classes um, and some of the kind of basic science classes where you really do need to be in the lab and actually hands on doing the experiments and that kind of thing. Um, what I did find this year, though, that was really valuable is in addition to that, once kind of COVID settles down and we're able to get back into the labs, I think you can still use the online format for particular parts of a practical. So this year, some of our anatomy practicals had student-led tutorials within them, embedded in the practical, which a lot of people found really useful. So we were being taught by the third and fourth year students who'd already learnt the material the year before you know, they made quizzes for us, you know, they had uh, videos and other resources that were, were very valuable and, and useful. And I think, um, I mean, our entire year passed our mids and exams recently. So obviously some of it's gone through, <laughs> but yeah, so I think it would never replace, but in addition to uh, would, would be the way forward. Great. Thank you, Sally. And I understand particularly anatomy has done some wonderful 3D kind of work. So they've really come and show us um, what, what e-learning can be like. We should have that when I was a student. Um, okay, and I'll just read out what Ricardo Natoli put on here, and that will probably be the last question for the session because we've run way out of time, sorry. Uh, so Ricardo is saying, um, I've been immensely proud of all the members of the medical school for their ongoing support to our medical students and staff and organisations only as great as its leadership, and I believe the medical school leadership is... Uh, displayed during this period has been phenomenal. I want to thank everyone for a great session and the leadership of the members of tonight's panel. Thank you, Ricardo. My question is, what improvements have come out from this period of time that should be continued post-COVID to make the medical school better in the future? For example, the adaptation of remote learning and accessibility to material live at home. And I do believe that's a question for Sally and Sam. And then I wonder whether Ian could comment or whether he knows what uh, on ANU, sorry, I keep saying on ANU camps, you know, the rest of ANU um, is thinking about that. Sally and, and Sam. I think, uh, Ricardo, I definitely do think that there are aspects of our COVID response that should stay. And to me, probably the most important part to student experience has been the fact that students appreciate flexibility. Students appreciate choice um, as does everybody else. And I think that's probably the biggest element to remain. So if that means maintaining parts of the curriculum as remote deliverable, if that means uh, allowing us to study part-time, if that means some other flexible arrangements, um, then I think that should stay and that should be a part of the future, the medical school of the future. Okay, thank you, Sam. Sally? Yeah, so I, I agree with Sam's point. I think in addition to that, um, the wellbeing task force that was set up earlier this year with Nikki and the year coordinators was incredibly useful response to the COVID situation. But into the future, I think something similar to that could potentially be a really useful thing for students moving mm -hmm. forward because um, students face challenges anyway, <laughs> obviously not as much as this year, but I found that having that framework behind, um, behind the scenes really did help to know who to go to to ask for help and you know, have help from the other year coordinators as well who might have experienced with similar issues. Um, that was really useful. So 
yeah, that could be continued. Thank you. And what about um, well-being for students on Acton campus? You guys, any thoughts on what should be um, developed? So I won't be bold enough to say what we should keep, but I think um, there are aspects of healthcare delivery which have fundamentally changed mm -hmm. in the last few months. So um, Australia has been dancing around telemedicine and other modalities of healthcare delivery for probably 20 years, never able to really satisfactory land it, a really important issue in terms of options for remote community care. Um, we're not going to unwind that. That, 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 that. that situation has now changed. It's part of our delivery landscape into the future. It has problems, it has, has opportunities. We'll need to work through that. But that won't, that won't be undone. And it, it's, similarly in, it's similar in terms of the local um, issues around the Acton campus. So we, we deliver a significant proportion of our counselling services now through distance modalities. Uh, I don't want to take a view that that's going to replace all uh, on face-to-face -face care. I certainly hope it doesn't because there's so much uh, richness in the per interpersonal encounter. But as an option, I suspect it will stay uh, in terms of the range of options that we might uh, provide to students in terms of wellbeing support and expand, expand access. So, so um, you know, COVID is, is a disruptor. It will change the face of things. And I think we should, you know, uh, you know we need to create it both as the negative impact, but also the, the creative impact that will force us to rethink our modes of care, our modes of delivery, and what we what we do uh, to achieve those desirable outcomes, which is quality of care. Thank you, and Nikki. So, those of you who don't know, Nikki Shkembri is a radiologist and provides all her so expert services online to a different continent. I understand. Do you have views on? Um, the changes for the future that are good for not just for clinical work, but particularly for student and student experience, you know, with you, what you've experienced over the last few months as well. Yeah, no, so it, it definitely has taught us a lot. And uh, with me having transitioned to remote clinical work for the past two, three years anyway, having been a full time um, hospital radiologist, it, it definitely gives me an opportunity to embrace certain changes with a view to the school of the future so with what Sam and Sally were saying you know the fact that you know the impossibilities happened overnight you know there's always been discussions on you know certain modes of uh, um, teaching styles and learning styles that are not possible clearly we've made it happen and with very little resources we had it's Possibly not, you know, state of the art, but in all honesty, I think it is state of the art for us because we're able to deliver what is the most essential to graduate our students. And I'll definitely embrace these varied modes of learning with a view to really promote and push forward the idea of flexible um, teaching. Um, this is something that's happening globally and I'd really, you know, as, as you know, heading the student support team, I'd really encourage that to, this is on the agenda of the School of the Future. Um, it puts us on the global spectrum um, in competition with other schools in having that um, opportunity available to students across the world um, to access our um, education resources. Um, but particularly also to students who have uh, restrictions for their own personal reasons and aren't able to maintain a full-time commitment, but equally can be, um, you know, our future graduates in a more flexible approach. The other thing as well that I've really learned and really want to embrace is the peer support network um, that Sally and her team um, initiated, um, which, which was a fantastic learning experience for all of us and I think you know it's it's not really up to COVID to keep these peer support networks going it's something that really should have always been there our students need um, each other's support different students are coming from different walks of life and and as Prof Anderson was saying you know it could be quite an intimidating environment to be 
um, when you first step in into a medical school cohort. And as a small medical school, we really want to be seen as one large family. And we want to make sure that that network um, is, is kept going. So these are very much the two things I really want to keep them going for future. Great, thank you, Nikki. And um, Ricardo, that's a really interesting question you've asked. Um, as you may, all of you may know, the Medical Deans of Australia and New Zealand are holding, we're, sorry, we're planning to have their annual conference this year here in Canberra. Now we'll still have it, but it'll be a, a virtual conference, obviously. Um, and the topic, uh, so Imogen Mitchell is leading that. Uh, she put her hand on our behalf up for that um, last year. And the, the topic um, of this conference is creativity out of calamity. And that's exactly the question. So there'll be a lot of talks around what have we learned, what went well, particularly around the liaison with the um, health services. Um, but the, the final ses session will be around exactly that question. What do we want to keep? What has this allowed us to do that we had planned for the last 10 years? I mean, and you just talked health medicine, I completely support. I hope we'll never go back to the old ways of sitting for hours in waiting rooms and, you know, wasting patients' times. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what comes out of that session. And that's, you know, all um, medic, um, Australian and New Zealand medical schools sticking their heads together. Okay, so I'm very aware of the time, and I do apologise that we've gone way over time, but I thought it was a important and interesting discussion. I'd just like to thank our panel members, so Nikki Shkemri and Sally and Sam, um, for making themselves available, all of you to attend, and in particular, um, Professor Anderson for introducing himself to us. Feel welcome to be part of the medical school, Ian, um, and making his time and, and sharing his experiences with us. Um, I will send out the PowerPoint if you're interested. Uh, you can read it, otherwise you can store it somewhere safely or delete it. Um, I hope you have a great evening. And um, I'm sure we shall get together very soon for an update on anything med school related. Thank you so much. See you later. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Bye.